Clerk will call the roll. Glenn Whitley, County Judge. Here. Roy Charles Brooks, Commissioner of Precinct 1. Present. Andy H. Wynn, Commissioner of Precinct 2. Here. Gary Fickus, Commissioner of Precinct 3. Here. J.D. Johnson, Commissioner of Precinct 4. Here. Constitutes a quorum. Thank you. Our invocation today will be delivered by Craig Maxwell. Craig, we appreciate it. After the invocation, please remain standing for our pledges. <clears throat> Thank you, Judge. Commissioners, if you bow your head. Lord, we are all thankful to be surrounded by those whose lives touch us more than they'll ever possibly know. We are thankful that you've blessed us beyond measure, thankful that in our hearts lives life's greatest treasure, that you, dear Jesus, reside in that place. And I'm ever so grateful for your unending grace and love. So please, Heavenly Father, bless these times that you've provided us and look out after those who need your strength, your mercy, and your blessings. Let us all enjoy the upcoming holidays to get together with family and friends to enjoy life. Look out after those who give us security and a sense of calm in these difficult times. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Thank you, Craig. Agenda announcements, Mr. Manius? Your Honor, we do not have any agenda announcements. I'd just like to uh, remind the court, though, we're going to hopefully be out of closed session before noon, and, and uh, we have our Thanksgiving luncheon. It's in uh, 504, and it'll begin at about 12 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you. Court members, you have before you the minutes of our special call meeting of November the 16th and our regular meeting of November the 17th. Move approval of both. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Uh, Commissioner Brooks, Commissioner Fickus. Motion passes unanimously. You have before you the consent agenda. Move approval of consent agenda. Second. We have a motion to second to approve the consent agenda. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Mr. Manius. Thank you, Honor. Members of Court, we have three additional items for you this morning. The first, we're requesting that the Commissioner's Court concur with actions of the Hospital District Board of Managers and approve an ATM lease agreement between the Hospital District and J.P. Morgan Chase Bank. Uh, this is to locate an ATM machine in the patient uh, care provision. Move approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Why Please. do we have to approve such a piddly item? Because our policy requires that any type of lease of hospital district property needs to be approved by the commissioner's court. Even a two by two? Actually a 16 square foot? Yes, sir. <laughs> All right. Bye. I got a different question. <laughs> Why are we giving it away? Thanks. The only reason I could uh, I could explain I I don't know particularly what the answer that they do that they, they do have a lease already oh. in the uh, in the main hospital uh, for 16 square feet uh, Chase does for the ATM machine I believe that that was, that lease was a, a a free space lease also. Um. That doesn't answer your Why question. Why did we not ask our credit union to look at this and see if they want to put a machine in there? I guess because it's the JPS's decision, not ours. Why is it before us today to approve if it's not ours? Because this this because court adopted a policy. Why we have to approve it. This court adopted a policy probably 10 years ago relating to the sale lease of real estate as relates to the hospital okay. district. And that's why it's before you this morning. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. 
Members of court, if we can go to item number two. We're requesting that the commissioner's court approve amendment number one to the tech share prosecutor 2015 resource sharing addendum. This is the M&O addendum. I would like to point out several things on this. First of all, this, uh, this time period uh, for the resource sharing agreement is January 1, 2016 through December 31st, uh, 2016. This is a new cycle that, uh, that TechShare is developed for all of, all of its uh, M&O projects. And um, that being said, actually this agreement starts in November, but it, the, the period of work period is, is, between, is the calendar year 16. It's going to require two payments, one for the FY15 payment, and that payment is $382,723.45, which is due in December next month. And then there will be an additional payment in October of 2016 for $127,000 plus uh, to cover the total cost of this is $510,297.93. And staff is recommending approval. Move approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. By the way, we are currently in the process of implementing prosecutor, and uh, uh, Ms. Wilson has been involved along with the various clerks uh, since, uh, it seems like forever, but it, I guess it's been since last week. And uh, we worked this weekend. Um, uh, the, the go live, the go, no go, will be, uh, we'll make a final decision tomorrow. But there's been a lot of people, not only from CUC, but from IT staff and obviously the district, criminal district attorney staff that have been working on this all weekend. And uh, I, hopefully we will be successful in going live tomorrow. How is it looking? You know, we've had, we, it's, it's been a good exercise, quite frankly. We, we found some issues. Uh, the good thing about it is that we have the staff on site that have corrected those issues. Uh, and I say they have worked some long hours on it, but but it looks really pretty good right now. But we'll know for certain by tomorrow. Thank everybody for their diligence in uh, work on trying to make sure we get this done. It's a this is a, you know a, a little bit of a down week, and so we thought this was a good time to try to roll this out. Um, but as is found with any implementation, it's kind of like remodeling versus new construction. When you tear away that board, there's usually something behind it that you didn't anticipate. So we appreciate everybody's uh, understanding and hard work in that area. Thank you, Your Honor. If we could go to item number three, this is also an approval of amendment uh, with uh, TechShare Juvenile and Juvenile Case Management System, Basic 2013. This is amendment number four. This is the maintenance and operations amendment. Uh, it is very similar to the one dealing with prosecutor in that the, uh, the period is a, a January 1 through December 31st, 2016. There is a slight difference in that uh, the, uh, for the remainder of this fiscal year, there are two payments. One is, is one that will be need to, needed to be made in December of this year, and that's an amount of $305,280. And that covers a six-month period. And then in June, we will do another payment of 152639 That will take us to the end of our fiscal year. And then this contract, like I said, is a, is a calendar year contract. And we have one payment in the FY17 budget of 152639 for the remainder of this contract. Staff is recommending approval. This is for maintenance and operation, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. So moved. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Ms. Tidwell? We have two items we're asking the court to consider this morning. The first is the approval of the um, annual update to the investment policy. Um, the changes that were made were clerical and administrative in nature. We've not changed any of the specific strategies or substance of the policy. So with that, I would ask that you approve the investment policy. Move for approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. 
And our second item is to receive and file the quarterly investment report for the period ended September 30th, 2015. So moved. Second. second. A motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Worthy. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Our first item is to request that you receive and file the personnel agenda. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to receive and file the personnel agenda. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Our second item is to request approval for an out-of-class pay extension for M information technology. This would be effective November 29th, and the cost to the county of the general fund would be $2,975.74. Move for approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Our last item is to, is to request approval to changes to the table of organization to the criminal district attorney's office. This is a request to reclassify um, the a grade 57 assistant chief investigator to a position of digital forensic and technical services manager. And the cost to the county is um, $3,260.21, including fringes. Move approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Mr. Beecham. What was the score this week? Oh, man. A sad week for all concerned. 51 to 51 to 50. <laughs> I'm thinking the next time we play y'all, you probably have a new coach, and hopefully we'll have a new special teams coach. I don't know. Miles has got nine lives. <laughs> we, we have just one item for your consideration this morning. It's a bid award recommendation for bid 2016-026, sale recycled paper. Recommendation will be toward the high bidder, Evergreen Sales, or purchasing cardboard from the county at the rate of $85 per ton. No approval. Second. A motion to second. How did we manage not to have a revised thing in our sheet? I'm sorry? How did we manage not to have a revised? We always have a revised thing on our um, Purchasing was timely, and uh, we received it. You know what that does is that just threw you under the bus for the other 52 weeks out of, or the 51 weeks out of this year. I'm normally there anyway, so I'm... <laughs> Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Wynn. Yes, Your Honor. I move for the approval of item 7J, 1A, and B. Uh, that's an interlocal agreement with the city of Canada. Second. A motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Are there any appointments? And we will move on to the claims, including the addendum. Move approval of the claims, including the addendum. Second. We have a motion to second to approve the claims, including the addendum. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Briefing items, Mr. Manius. Thank you, Your Honor. Members of the court, we have three items for you this morning. The first concerns the accreditation of the Public Health Accreditation Board for Tarrant County Public Health. Mr. Tenasia is here to address the court at this time. An outstanding achievement. Thank you. Thank Ms. you. Dr. Tenage. Thank you. Good morning, members of the court. Um, so today I'm here to talk about the uh, Public Health Accreditation Board uh, National Accreditation for Tarrant County Public Health. Um, on uh, November 13th, which was Friday, uh, you know, we got notified that on November 10th, Wednesday, the Public Health Accreditation Board met and decided to uh, bestow upon us the national accreditation status for public health accreditation. And uh, I kind of wanted to explain what that is, because uh, Commissioner Wynn asked last time, what is public health accreditation? So it is the measurement of a, the uh, health department, Tarrant County Public Health's performance against a set of nationally recognized, practice-focused, and evidence-based standards of public health practice. Um, and the issuance of accreditation by a nationally recognized entity, which is the Public Health Accreditation Board. So the question is, why is this a big deal? Well, Tarrant County is the first county health department in Texas to achieve the national accreditation. We're only the second local health department in the state of Texas behind the city of Houston. And then we're among the first 100 health departments in the entire country 
to have achieved this uh, national coveted status. There's about 2,900, 2,884, somewhere in that range, health departments in the country, so that makes us in the top 3% in the entire country. So that's why we're here trying to you know, tell you all about all the stuff that we've done, and uh, this is really uh, kind of a big deal in, in the public health world. Uh, so what does accreditation look for? Uh, they look for a variety of things, including leadership. Uh, they want to make sure that the health department is doing strategic planning to address issues. Uh, we, they want us to be engaged in our community. Uh, they look at a customer-focused health department, a uh, health department that's uh, focused on workforce development to improve the staffing and the capacity that we have, and also on evaluating the services that we provide and continuous quality improvement. And they also look at governance structure, where you all, as the governing entity, play a role. So all of these things were looked at, and they said, hey, Tarrant County, you guys are doing good, so we will bestow upon you the national accreditation status. So what are some of the benefits? Uh, why should a local health department do this? And now, mind you, this is a voluntary effort. It's not required that we go through this accreditation, but it, is, uh, it brings about a lot of benefits. So it helps identify strengths and areas of improvement for your local health department and for your community in general. Uh, it strengthens internal and external partnerships. It encourages the local health departments to prioritize and address long-standing health concerns in the community. It acts as a stimulus of continuous quality improvement, which I will tell you is one of the biggest benefits we've reaped in our health department. For two years in a row, we've had sort of an internal friendly competition among divisions to do uh, quality improvement projects. Uh, and they've put out storyboards about what they've done. And I mean, some of the work that they're doing is tremendous. Uh, you know, there's, all projects are great. Last year we had 19, this year we had 12. But some of them are really on the cutting edge of uh, doing things in public health and they're improving the quality of the work that we do. So I'm really proud of that. Uh, and also there's a focus on performance improvement. So we're starting to improve our uh, employee performance within public health by engaging in those strategies. Um, and then also it improves accountability to external stakeholders, which would be our community partners in the community. It improves our competitiveness for funding opportunities. And it's kind of a given when you're a high performing health department, you're going to have your ducks in a row. Whenever a grant opportunity comes out, you're going to have community partnerships built up. You're going to have, you know, the capacity to go after grant dollars. Uh, so this really is one of the benefits that comes out. And then it strengthens our communication with the governing entity. Um, so how did we get here? Uh, it took us over two years and a lot of work in the community and within the health department to do this. Uh, we had to do a community health assessment, a community health improvement plan, a strategic plan, and of course the continuous quality improvement, and then performance improvement. Uh, so who, who all was involved? Well, the entire Tarrant County Public Health team was involved. Everybody had a role to play. Of course, leadership team was heavily involved and they did, you know, strategic visioning and direction setting for our staff and our, our, our managers. Uh, but really, I, I wanted to take a moment and thank Dr. Lou Brewer, who was the previous health director, who set our vision for accreditation in 2012. Uh, she set us on the path to go achieve this, and then uh, you know, she retired, and uh, Ann Sailor Caldwell, who's here with me today, oversaw the documentation submission. So we didn't make it miss a beat, that there was a leadership change, we did not miss a beat. And uh, she saw that uh, documentation submission happen in 2014. And then I came in at the end of 2014 and there was a site visit and accreditation uh, during my tenure here in 2015. And then here are some of the key players and I'd like for my team to stand up as I call out their name and along with the leadership team members that are here. Uh, Donald Fisher, uh, accreditation coordinator. This person has single-handedly shepherded <laughs> almost 400 employees in, in public health. And I tell you, that's a tough job to have 400 people telling you different things, and he's managed it all. Uh, Yvette Wingate, uh, she's been our lead on the community health assessment and community health improvement. Uh, Florestine Mack and Michelle Markham, they led the continuous quality improvement uh, process. And Jeremy Gallops, I don't think he's here today, but he led our, um, the documentation review before submission. And among that, there were other people that could not be here today, but uh, these are some of the key players who uh, led the process. Uh, and a uh, special thank you to you, the Tarrant County Commissioner's Court, which is our governing entity, and uh, also to Tarrant County Administrator, Mr. G. Kamenius, who's been a tremendous support and, a, and continuously provides us encouragement to be the best health department that we can. So what are the next steps? Well, accreditation requires an ongoing health department commitment to quality improvement and adherence to national standards. 
So we will continue to work on that, and we have this accreditation status for the next five years, but they'll be back in 2020, and we'll start our process of documentation and you know, submitting all the materials uh, sooner than that, but they'll be looking for us to continue to improve on our processes. And I'll tell you a little joke I shared with uh, Commissioner Brooks earlier, is that uh, one of the findings they had is that, oh, you need to be telling your governing entity, you know, how, what their role is. And I'm like, oh, I don't know, you know, it's kind of a tough spot, you know, don't put me there. Um, and Shannon Wingo uh, had an uh, idea about how do we fix that. So if you remember, you all approved a worksite lactation policy. So that was our way to engage you in uh, joint decision making about public health. <laughs> and that is also, we're only one of the first health departments in Texas who has a approved worksite lactation policy, not only for our health department, but for the entire county. So that is the kind of work that accreditation encourages. So thank you for your support uh, in doing that. And uh, you know, we look forward to answering any questions you may have. So the accreditation is something that is, it's voluntary. Yes, sir. And how long has it been in existence? Uh, I think in 2008 or 9 they started the process, and there's been about now there's about 86 health departments, uh, and so it, they formed a, uh, a voluntary uh, national board, uh, an accreditation body, if you will, and they engage uh, staff from a variety of health departments. Sometimes they're health directors that are on the board, and there's site visitors involved, and they go and review materials and do site visits and such. So that's, uh, that's the process that's, that's being followed. I really wish that they could have titled it, designated something other than accreditation, because everybody thinks, well, you're accredited. I mean, that's, everybody should be accredited. And so, I, I mean, I think this is really a great deal, and I really applaud all of y'all who I know have worked very hard in, in reaching this stage. Uh, uh, and I'm sure you're going you're to get them good recognition in the paper and everything on we'll this. try. <laughs> Thank you. So we're, we're very excited and, and very proud of the job that y'all are doing over there. Thank you Thank you, so you much. sir. Much appreciated. All right. Thank you. Members of court, if we can go to item B. This is a voting equipment update. We've asked uh, Mr. Phillips to, uh, this is Frank Phillips, not David Phillips, Mr. Phillips, to address the court on this particular issue. Before he starts, I just want to, to say one of the things that, that is of important, one of several things that's important on this briefing is to note the potential cost that will be incurred by the county. Um, and I imagine you'll talk about how we did it last time yeah. and, um, and how we may start building those reserves that's going to be necessary to fund this particular expenditure. So. Mr. Phillips. Thank you. Good morning. Good, Good morning. morning. Back in 2000, everyone remembers that uh, the election uh, in Florida. As a result of that, the uh, U.S. Cong Congress passed the Help America Vote Act, and they introduced a lot of changes in our system. One of the main things was uh, the requirements that they put on our new voting systems. Before HAVA, there was a, a multitude of voting systems in the United States. Post HAVA, any election equipment used has to be approved by the Election Assistance Commission. Currently in Texas, there are three vendors that are authorized to sell equipment, HART, Premier, and ESNS. Tarrant County has chosen HART as our voting system. We made our initial purchases in 2001 and 2005, and in 2012 we bought a few extra pieces, about 100, I think, to help with the presidential election. Uh, you can see the, the total number of pieces of equipment we have there. We, were use, we used HAVA funds to purchase this equipment. HAVA was about a 3 to $4 billion nationwide program where the federal government gave states money to funnel down to the counties to purchase equipment. You may ask, why do we need to replace our voting equipment? Uh, our voting equipment works fine. The problem is our voting equipment is based on uh, Windows 2000. Windows 2000 no longer supported by Microsoft. Uh, and our equipment, as you can see, is anywhere from 10 to 15 years old. Before we can have a, a, a good discussion about what equipment would cost us, we need to decide a couple of things as a county. 
how we want to vote. Currently, we use a precinct-based voting system, which is you know the traditional voting system where we have an early voting period, and then on election day, everyone has to vote in their assigned election precinct. Several years ago, the state of Texas started a program where vote centers are a possibility. And there are a handful of counties in the state using vote centers now. Uh, Lubbock was the first one that pioneered it in the state of Texas. They've been very successful. Our closest neighbor that uses it is Collin County. Uh, vote centers work very much like election day. I mean, early voting. You can vote at any site on election day anywhere in the county just like you could in early voting. Now part of the benefit of a vote center is, is you can reduce the number of polling sites you have. Uh, the state mandates that in your first election after you adopt a voting center is that you can reduce to 65 percent of the number of election day sites you had under the traditional method. After that you can go down as low as 50 percent. However, I do want to say that there are other counties that have implemented vote centers in a different manner. Travis County has. They implemented vote centers but still maintain their same number of election day voting sites. They just allow anybody to go anywhere on election day to vote. Now, the issue would be, as far as we can tell, we've heard no, not even a rumbling of a Hava II. You know, the, the feds mandated certain types of voting equipment, they funded it, but there's been no plans to replace that equipment once it ages. Based on the new equipment that's out there today, actually HART right now is the only one with a certified system in the state of Texas that meets the, the newer 2005 voting standards. To replace equipment in the same amount that we had today would be approximately $12.2 million. Uh, we would advocate a, a small increase in the number based on uh, growing population. We estimate that if we went to vote centers, it could cost as much as $20 million. Uh, one of the questions that I asked, and I've asked it of other elections administrators that use vote centers, is why does it cost more? Or why do you need more equipment? Because you know, my initial reaction was I'm voting the same number of people. What difference does it make? But everyone that I've spoken to without fail says it takes more equipment because you have fewer sites, but you have to load up all of those sites with equipment because you don't know where anyone's going to vote. So you have to be prepared at each one for a huge turnout. Um, we have had the discussion uh, with Mr. Manus about, you know, how to possibly fund this. And as he said, uh, perhaps setting aside some reserves. I will say that uh, now this is was just heart I talked to. They did say that they do have uh, a multi-year um, funding capability so you you could pay that out while using the equipment instead of waiting to purchase the equipment after you reserve the funds. Do they have a lease program? Not that I'm aware of. Now let me back up. I know you can lease per election, but that would require them delivering equipment to you every election and then you returning it post-election. Do they have a maintenance software update program? They do. Let me speak to, well, they do on their new system. Windows 2000 on the current heart voting system was certified as a whole as part of the system. On their new voting system, the programmable side of the equipment, it was certified outside, or it was built outside of certification. So the equipment itself that you vote on is certified. If you wish to update Windows, and Windows comes out with a new version, with the new system you can update it. You can't update it on the system as it stands today. Of course, when we get to the point, in, and I don't know if you're going to talk about a timeline, but this is something we'll have to work with purchasing because this is going to be a bid issue or an RFP issue. It's not just one particular vendor. Correct. And I wanted to get this out before you just so we could start thinking about 
the future and that this is coming upon us. I, timeline, you know, I would think the next three years, four years, somewhere in that line. So, Frank, does this new equipment uh, come with the capability of producing a paper trail? Now, again, I can only speak about Hart's new system because they're the only one with a, a new certified system. The answer to that is yes, but it's different than, than our system now. Their new system, when you go in, you have a choice. It's, it can be true ballot on demand. You know, today we have to print thousands of ballots beforehand, deliver them to the sites, and then uh, an election judge gives you a, a, a paper ballot. Their new system, it, it looks very similar to the Eastlake that you're used to now if you vote electronically. And it gives you, I believe, three options. You can print a blank paper ballot on demand right there and fill it out and feed it through an optical scan device. You can use the, the electronic to mark your uh, ballot, and it'll mark it the way you vote. Then it'll print it out. You can confirm that it's marked it correctly the way you wanted to vote, and then feed that through an optical scan. Or you can vote just straight electronic with no paper. So it offers you an option that we don't have today. Does it automatically retain an image of the ballot? Yes. It does. Well, it's not, Hart doesn't maintain a, a true image of the ballot. It's not gonna be like a, a, like a picture of it, but it does, it, they call it a cast vote record. It maintains a record of, of each individual cast ballot. We use those now for recounts. So if I had a four-digit, it would take the four-digit code that you give me when I go into the ballot in the vote. I punch that in, and then it pulls up the ballot, and then it would say, so, you know, 3638 cast their ballot this way. Not exactly. It does not save that code. Even today, on today's system, when you go in, you get that four-digit code, and you go vote. Once you enter that four-digit code, that code disappears. It's not kept. And the reason for that is so we could not track an individual's vote down. You know, that gets in the privacy of a voter. You wouldn't want them to be able to track that number. So we only have three vendors in Texas? Only three that are certified. Correct? And all three are built upon Microsoft Windows? I don't know about the other two. I know Debold, uh, ESNS, I, I'm not sure what status they're built on. Now, I know ESNS is in the process of, of certifying new equipment in the state of Texas, so shortly Hart will, uh, ESNS will have new equipment that's certified also. So currently, Hart is the only one with new equipment. It's the only one with new certified equipment. Now, the other. That complies with the HAVA Act. Well, that, even the old ones still comply with HAVA. They, if you purchased equipment, which we did, that uh, meets 2001 standard, then that equipment's still usable and still certified. But the ones that have upgraded to the new standard created by the EAC back in actually 2005, we still call it the new standard. The only one that is going to meet that at this point is hard. But ESNS is on the verge. They're just going through the certification process. Questions? Is, is, that, is that the end of your presentation, Frank? The only, yes, sir. The only thing I would think is going forward, we may decide at some point on a process if we need a committee or, or what to move forward at some point. But that may be jumping the gun a little bit. And remember, we also have an election commission. Is it the commission that's? Correct. I know we have two committees, but we have a committee that is made up of the county clerk, the tax assessor collector, myself, and the two party chairs. Exactly. Which we do want to present to also. So. Right. We no. have talked about the um, voting centers. Um, there's not been, you know, everybody agrees that this is the way we need to go or not, but that's been, you know, that's probably been a year or so ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just keep in mind there are options on voting centers, and uh, Travis County was the first one that they she was able to maintain her same number of sites and go to the, the vote center method also. 
I like the concept of being able to vote in any location on election day like you can during early voting. I'm a bit reluctant to re reduce the amount of voting sites. That may have an adverse effect on some people's ability to access uh, uh, voting. Absolutely. Okay. I know other counties, they've, uh, when they've gone to the voting system process, uh, they've created committees with uh, multiple stakeholders who collectively decided on what sites to use or not. And that's what seems We've to We've talked here before them. about the fact that we have a tremendous number of voting sites. I think either we're very close to or greater than Harris County and certainly Dallas County. We're early voting, we're, we're, we are in excess of Harris County. Uh, they, they do have more election day sites than we do, but I believe we have more election day sites than Dallas County does. When you talk about the voting centers, is that every election uh, facility or location? you can do that at after I mean you're going to close some but every one of them is that or are there only select sites that become like sub courthouses and no every site would be every site every site okay you could vote anywhere in the county okay it would tremendously reduce the number of provisional votes we get on election day for people showing up at the wrong polling site at the last minute right there's a lawsuit in Austin involving voting equipment do you know anything about that? I believe there was. I believe that was out of. Uh, was it out of Travis County? Yeah, in Travis County. I believe so. Um, I'm not familiar with the details of it. I, I just know of its existence. And so, what if let's say, for example, that we had 600 sites on voting day? What you're saying is that the first election that we were to go to the new, if we were to go to the vote centers we would still have to have, by law, 390 or 65% of that. On your first election, the most you can reduce is to 65% of what you would have had under the traditional process. Okay. So that'd be 390, and then eventually you might work it down to 50%. To you can work it down to 50, correct. Yeah. I know that people can be very attached to their voting location. Yes, they can. We experience it several times. <laughs> yes. Yeah, they come to the sub courthouse on election day swearing they voted there for 10 years and they've never voted there on election day. Right. <laughs> Happens every election. Okay, so uh, you're proposing a timeline that we begin to look at this or what? what's the next step? What we wanted to do is to make the entire court aware of, of the potential that there's going to be a substantial expenditure within the next three to four years that since we don't believe or we are not aware now that the federal government is going to fund any of this, so then our task is over the next three years that we need to put together somewhere between 12 and $20 million. Normally that would come under um, non-debt capital. And as we go through the budget cycles, remember what we fund through non-debt capital. We, we fund uh, facility expansion. We fund... Uh, IT projects, uh, we fund um, vehicles and equipment, and so those are the type of things that we may need to cut back on if we're going to uh, uh, to be able to put that type of money together in about three, in, in a total of three years. Uh, the budget office and I have been talking extensively about this, and so we want to make you all aware of it so that if you see these type of uh, reductions in expenditures for non-debt capital. This is the primary reason. Second of all, we are going to continue to ask our departments that even though they might have been funded in some non-debt capital in their budget this year, not to spend all of it. To, if, you, if you can have any remaining, this will start help, helping us fill this uh, 12 to $20 million hole. So as far as a timeline is concerned, I don't know, I, I would suggest, I, just as a suggestion that uh, the Election Commission be briefed on this particular item also, so that everybody is eyes wide open on, on the fact that we're going to be 
changing out our voting machines. And hopefully by the time we get to, you know, within a year or so, when we'll hopefully have more than just one vendor that's certified. That way it can be a competitive bid. Of course, purchasing will need to be involved with that along with the auditor's office. So it's going to take about three years to accumulate the cash to purchase so we can still use the existing equipment for the next three years? Absolutely. Uh, like and I said, I, and I didn't want to create the impression that there's anything wrong, per se, with our current system. It's just I have to look ahead that, you know, Hart has already made a business decision to move to a, a new voting system. So that tells me at some point, you know, the, our current Hart voting system, they're going to not support. Now, they're telling us they're going to support that for years to come. What they can't do, though, is they can't so replace any new equipment. Then they can't. They can't replace Windows 2000. I mean, they can't upgrade it to a new system. I mean, to a new operating system. So, is there anything, Frank, that is going to cause this to occur all over the U.S. in the next X number of years? Well, it, it's really already started, and it, it has to do with the age of the equipment. I mean, most of this equipment is now in the at least 10-year-old range, some you know, 15. Roy, it, one of the things that we might want to do is try to focus NACO on this and see if we can't get some congressional yep. approval or some, some uh, support from that standpoint. So we might I think want to you're right. That. Right. We've I mean, got our fall board meeting next week, and we might be able to at least raise this as an issue. Right. I mean, realistically, you think, you know, the, they mandated Hava on us and funded it when it comes time to replace that equipment. We keep expecting to hear that round two is coming, but not a peep. And Hava was in 2000? 2002. Two. Two. Okay. Okay. Any questions, any other questions at this time? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Members of court, we can go to item C. This is the Tarrant County Law Enforcement Memorial. I place this on the agenda. I know that there's been some discussion as it relates to to moving forward with this particular project. Uh, let me just say a few things about it. First of all, this project was started a long time ago, and Commissioner Johnson has been uh, out or had in the past has been out raising uh, a substantial amount of money. I believe a little over twenty thousand uh, dollars for this memorial. Uh, we haven't been raising any uh, in the pa in the short past. And I know that there is some interest on the court by the court members to go ahead and, and to move forward with seeing if we could raise some additional funds. Um, I know that, um, that there has been an interest about uh, possibly contracting with a 501c3 to maybe allow people who are donating to the United Way to also donate to this particular fund through the United Way. That money would be captured and then returned to the county uh, as it relates to to that construction of that memorial. Now that we've finished the uh, west side of the historic courthouse, I believe that there's been some discussion as to where you might want to locate that. Uh, I do know that the 20 plus thousand that we have is not something that would be sent to any organization that would be kept in house. And whenever we're ready to make that expenditure, then that those funds would be available also. So. The purpose of this briefing today was simply to lay this issue out before you and to get any comments from the court members that you might have as it relates to this particular issue. Let me just remind you that uh, several years ago when I first brought this up, we designated a place on the east side of the courthouse. The court approved that location the, over there sort of at an angle behind the uh, water fountain. There's nothing sacred about that. I think it would be wonderful if we could start something like this on the west side. Wasn't available to us at that time, but just keep in mind the court has voted on this other location and have to be changed. Do we have, have, go ahead, I'm sorry. sorry. Do we have any idea how much money we're talking about? Back when we initially started this, Tim Curry and I looked at it together. We were looking at around 50000 at the time. Roy, that's been yeah. 20 years ago. Yeah. 15 or 20 years ago. So we're talking about. So you about can double or triple a statue that. Statue or. 
a series of statues or some sort of a until we get a a, a committee together and then we find a, an architect that will work with us hopefully voluntarily uh, donate some time and what have you but we're gonna have to have some um, professional help sure. to get exactly what it is but we're talking about law, what we initially started on was law enforcement personnel that have lost their their life in the line of duty in Tarrant County. Tarrant County law enforcement being JPs, uh, I mean constables, uh, sheriff. investigators, sheriff's office employees, these type of people. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and one of the things that the reason we're talking about the community trust is uh, I think there are a number of employees who might give on a paycheck by paycheck type basis. That could be wonderful. And that the county, we've talked with the county's the payroll. The only thing that we have set up right now that allows for a payroll deduction is through the United Way. The United Way will, you know, if we designate it on the United Way farm to go to this uh, fund within the community trust, then, you know, in conversation with them, they said they would be glad to do that, and in addition, that they might have some of their different funds that had been set up already, that they might actually be able to make a contribution to it too. I'm in the. I will be. Uh, or Catherine and I over the next couple of weeks will be visiting each shift at each location in the sheriff's department in the jails, and I talked with the sheriff about you know making sure he was okay with us discussing this and. Uh, you know, rolling that out at that point in time. And, you know, I think the minimum in order for the United Way to do that is like a, a $50. So if everyone gave $2 a, a paycheck and just had $2 a paycheck withheld, then that would begin to establish that and give us a way to raise that. Because I think you're right. I think that, you know, uh, as Commissioner Brooks asked, I think you're probably going to be looking at 100 to 200,000 probably now. Again, depending upon whatever the the committee decided they wanted to, to do. We, we want an appropriate memorial for these folks. Right. Sure. Absolutely. And I know you've talked about, uh, as far as a committee, uh, you know, you chairing that committee and then having uh, myself and uh, Dee and Sharon uh, as the four people on that committee and, and looking at it from that perspective. So. Uh, that's kind of we've got a form that we'll probably approve next week that will actually set up the fund at the uh, uh, community trust yeah and we need to also verify that the money that I have collected which is all private money by the way um, <clears throat> can be transferred into that well I don't know what what I would suggest is that we just keep that money in the auditor's office and that way we're not transferring money what this will do is it will allow employees who want to give that it'll be a tax deductible by it being it there they'll just keep it over there and then when we get ready to do whatever the committee decides to do then we can just bring they'll write the check to to, to the vendor or to whoever we need to do to get it done and then Renee's the money has maintained this fund for all these years right yeah, yeah. yeah the problem with just doing it to the to the <coughs> auditor's fund is we really don't have a formal 501 c3 That's the community right. trust provides us that vehicle and it allows anybody who gives to that to be able to take a tax deduction for it. yeah we can work out those details i just wanted to bring it up for a discussion so that we you can give us some direction and so what we will do uh we'll prepare the uh, community trust has given us a, a an agreement there's some things we need to change on that we're working with the cda on that right now we'll have that up for your approval next week all right thank you thank you anything else not at this time your honor then at this time we will uh recess our open meeting and proceed to close to discuss items exempted under texas government code 551.071072074076 087 of the texas government code
having returned from our closed session and there being no business to um, do at this time, then we are adjourned. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving.